I also found a secret about taste that if you want to build a taste for something, build it in your head before you take a thing. If you want to like somebody, like that person in your head before you meet the person. This is amazing how it works. That uh, actually the, the basic foundation of this theory that the taste starts from within was laid down by a great German psychologist, Sigmund Freud, Simon Freud. Simon Freud said that when you say you like something, you would have a taste for it, it's not because of the thing. It's because of the anticipation you have about the thing. He explained that in our mind, there are layers of anticipation always working. One platform comes and you anticipate something, another replaces it, you start thinking of something else. These are moving platforms of anticipation always working in our head. And when you're anticipating, and you anticipate something you're going to eat, something you're going to eat, something involving taste, when the anticipation says it's very nice, the thing will be nice. He said the taste does not begin from the thing, it begins from your head. A very interesting point he made. In old Germanic he called eine Verlockungsprämie. Eine Verlockungsprämie, that means the uh, actual is for not the, is prime to getting the thing that you get the taste for it. I have experimented since I learned about it. I have experimented supposing I meet, want to meet a person who hates, hates me. And I say, let me look at the good qualities of that person. And then I remember there are good qualities. Every person, even those you hate or they hate you, have some good quality. Think of that good quality in your head. You need that person to behave differently because suddenly something has happened to your attitude. So I thought if this is the power lying in our mind and recognized by a man who lived long ago, <coughs> wrote, it, wrote about it, why not use it in our daily life? One of the advantages of knowing the power of our own mind, the power of our own consciousness, the power of turning this world around with what is in your head. Once I had a seminar about 30, 40 years ago, a seminar on happiness, that so what makes people happy. And I said, happiness comes from happiness. If you are happy, you will meet happy people. And so we did an exercise. There were a group of 20, 30 people. And we said, now for one week, all of you pretend that you are happy. Not that you are really happy, because nobody is really happy all the time. You have some moments of happiness, some moments of unhappiness, some ups and downs. But pretend, just pretend for one week that you are happy. Any person you meet, smile and show that you are full of happiness, even though it's fake. <laughs> but you still show that happiness. After one week, we will review how many angry people you met, how many happy people you met, how many uh, people who you like to hate you met. So after one week we reassembled to compare notes. All of them without exception said this whole week was wonderful. We met all happy people. Just by pretending that you're happy, you can make people happy and that happy transmits back and forth to each other. So there was a book I read long ago, uh, very popular at that time, called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. In that book, there is one chapter on smiling. And he said, when you smile, you disarm the other person. And you should smile whether you like to smile or not. I was surprised, he said, if you are not feeling like smiling, but you still smile, smile at every person you meet, and every person will smile back. It's so amazing. That these things lie in your hands, not in the other person. We unfortunately hand over a lot of our state of happiness to other people. We don't realize that there's so much we can do to make other people happy also, then you become happy. If you are in a happy crowd, you are happy. And if you are listening to a person who's always depressed, you get depressed also with it. So therefore, this is very mutual exchange. The Swamiji of uh, Agra, 
uh, who said Shivdyal Singh, and he started this movement called Radha Swami and the path of the masters and so on. In his one of his teachings, he says that uh, love and devotion is the key to good meditation. If you do meditation mechanically, you get nothing. With love and devotion, you get it. But they say love and devotion only comes if the master is extending it to you. Because otherwise you, you don't know how to present love and devotion on your own. In what way? What's the method? He says the method is pretend that you are devoted. He actually uses these words. Pretend that you are in love and you are devoted. Pretend in your own mind that you and that pretense will be become real over time. So he made a recommendation. Why I'm mentioning this thing to you is that these are very practical tips these people have given us. How so much of our life, of happiness or unhappiness, is dependent upon us and not upon others. And we are continuously becoming dependent on other people. What they say, what he said this, she said this, and we are messing up our own life based on what other people are saying. You should not bother what other people are saying. You should bother what your state of mind is, how happy you are. And you can pretend to be happy. You will make those people happy who are saying this or saying that. The other thing is that talking ill of somebody doesn't help us at all. And it's very common. Common gossip among people is to say some scandalous things, some things wrong about other people, so and so did this, so and so person did this, and enjoy saying all that. Great master, my teacher, my master used to say that there are many sins in this world, but they are pleasant, pleasant, pleasurable sins. But talking ill of somebody is a sin that has no pleasure at all in it. So why talk ill of anybody? If you restrain yourself from passing judgment or talking ill of somebody, you make your own life better and your own life happy. So these are some few tips they have given. They are external and internal both, and they affect our life a lot. So that's why uh, when you want to practice meditation of any kind, the best meditation is where you go within yourself through imagination, attention, and power of concentration. And do not go below the eyes because if your goal is to seek higher awareness, nothing below the eyes can be found. No matter what yoga you have done, no matter what you are going to do, there is no awareness, higher awareness below the eyes. Stay in the eyes. Best way to meditate is to consider this body as a residence, as a house, that you are living in this body. That you are not the body, it's your house, dwelling place. This has got many floors, starting from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a sixth floor based upon the energy centers below. Or you are already on the sixth floor when you are awake. We are all on the sixth floor when we are awake. Why go down to the basement and to other floors when you are already on the sixth floor? Proceed from there. So the meditation should be that you imagine this is a house which is a nice big room at the top. When you close your eyes, this room it does not remain the size of the head. It expands. It's a big place. It can be as big as you want to make it. Uh, I was speaking in Lithuania the other day, and a person who was taking uh, the uh, recording the event, he said when I said the area inside can expand, he felt it expanded to such an extent that he himself expanded. And as he went on, he said the whole universe came into it. The whole universe came in his head. This is not a small place. It only looks small because we are outside. If you are inside, it's not small at all. It's as large as you want to make it. But start by making it a small place. Make it a small room on the sixth floor of your house. You sit in the center of that room. Examine it. We will do, it. We do a little uh, practice right now. You examine what's in that room. Is it, is it dark? Are there some light spots? Are there some windows and doors? Does it need any furnishing? Does it need any drapes or something? And then you furnish your room. Put a nice carpet. 
not down anywhere, right to the sixth floor, to the ceiling of the fifth and the floor of the sixth. Genuine imagination that you are sitting on that and a very nice comfortable place, nice rug, nice drapes on the side and a beautiful, wonderful chair to sit on or a cushion to sit on for meditation. Don't meditate outside. Don't meditate on a chair or a cushion or pillow outside. Meditate on a cushion or chair inside. Once you seat yourself inside, you can examine what the things are. Then think of nothing else except what the room looks like, what your chair looks like, what things that you see there look like. The longer you stay and examine things inside, your all the attention will be drawn inside and a whole new world will begin to appear right inside. It's that simple. The only thing that comes in the way of doing it is our mind and its thinking process which keeps on thinking of outside things. There's no other problem. While we are doing this, we keep on thinking of other things. If we can control that part, control at that moment, don't think of anything else, you will have a successful meditation. Would you like to try it? You are all very good candidates for meditation and for discovering yourself. You are all seekers of the same truth that all people following religion, doing yoga all over the world are trying to find. Some of them spend so much time outside looking for these things and you are carrying the entire treasure inside. The door will open right where you just visited, inside. That's the place, the tenth door, the third eye, the eye behind these two eyes where you were sitting and watching and doing all those things. We use all those things. That's the place where you have to start. You, this is just a sampling. Uh, we don't have the time to do full-time meditation. Of course, those interested in doing more meditation with me can join one of the meditation workshops. We are having a meditation workshop. Jonathan? September 12th, 13th and 14th in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. In Rice Lake, Wisconsin, September 12th, 13th and 14th, those who want to go into extensive meditation can join me there and we practice together so we can make some real progress, see a lot more than what you just experienced. But I'm happy that so many of you enjoyed this. So you see, it's not such a chore that we make meditation because we think meditation is a mechanical thing. It's not. It's an interaction with your beloved. It's an expression of your love inside. It's, it's a beautiful experience. And yeah, therefore, you will actually enjoy meditation. I would now like to answer some of the questions that you wrote up on those pieces of paper. I am confused about what it means to go with the flow. Sometimes I think it means following other people's requests or suggestions, but often there are contradictory suggestions. And sometimes my own thoughts are different from other people's suggestions. What does it mean to go with the flow here? That's a very good question. In the 60s, when I came to this country, the most popular slogan was, go with the flow. Everywhere I went, they said, yes, we are going with the flow. Nobody knew what it meant, but they kept on saying it. I began to think that the only way to go with the flow is to keep on saying, go with the flow. The truth is, that there are two ways of going in life. One is to go with the mind, and the other is to go with the flow. When you make a decision with your mind, where to go, then that is going with the mind. When you don't use the mind to make a decision where to go and the guidance is given by something else, it's called going with the flow. Going with the flow is also called living in God's will, living in the higher will, uh, will of the higher power, live of our own higher self. It is the same thing. Go with the flow means not going with the trend and direction given by your mind. There are two ways to judge what is the way to go with the flow. One is, what does your intuition say? The intuition, that gut feeling, 
that you get suddenly what to do without having to think about it before you have thought about it. And the gut feeling comes, let's go with the flow. It is accompanied, most of the time, this gut feeling is accompanied by an external evidence we call a coincidence. A coincidence supports that. Supposing your gut feeling says you should go west to that particular place and you are driving your car and they say go west for some other reason altogether. You say, what is this? My gut feeling said west. But there is a sign saying west. Or I open my book on, <clears throat> on a fiction story and the page I turn starts with in the west. Where does this word west come? Outside and inside. It's a direction for go with the flow. If you follow these clues that come to you all the time with your gut feeling and they are accompanied with indications from outside that this is a, not a simple thought that came to you, it was accompanied by an evidence of outside coincidence. This happens, it gives you direction how to go with the flow. Otherwise, the circumstances around you tell you to go with the flow. Uh, Rumi, great poet, mystic Rumi, he says, people have asked me this question, how do you live in God's will? <laughs> is it everything God's will? Even our mind functioning is God's will? Then what is the meaning of living in God's will? His answer is, God has himself created two wills. He has created the mind as an individual unit functioning with free will of its own and he has created himself in everything. So that's also evidence that God's will is expressed there. He says, when you go only with your thought stream, you are going with your mind. When you go besides that with what the circumstances are telling you, you are going in God's will. And he explains, for example, if God has given you a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will, dig. If he has given a pen in your hand, the circumstances have put a pen in your hand, he has expressed his will, write. So if you find that the circumstances have been placed have been placing you in a situation, you act in a particular way, act as go with the flow. But if you start thinking with the mind, I am saying this, my friend is giving this suggestion, another friend is giving this suggestion, that's all mind's flow. That's not going with the flow. If you say people are advising me that I want to accept everybody's request, that's a mental game. That's not going with the flow. Going with the flow is ignoring everything that people say or your mind says. And then see what circumstances say, go with the flow. So this is, again, going with the flow needs some practice. To do things without the power of thinking, but with the power of your own intuitive gut feeling. When you start doing that, then think how to do it. Use the mind for the purpose for which it was given to us. The mind was not given to us to make decisions for us. The mind was given to us so that the soul's gut feeling decisions should be implemented by the mind. We should give direction to the mind, I know I have to do this, now do it like this and make the mind work to do that which has come to you. You are going with the flow. That's how you go with the flow. A little practice will make you go every, very easily every day how to go with the flow. A little practice on these two principles. That means a decision made with the mind either by talking to other people or thinking in your own head is not going with the flow. When you go with the circumstances around you, what they dictate, Somebody has come, ask for help, you help, because the circumstances created, you are going with the flow. Okay? You frequently tell us that if we withdraw our attention, we will become aware of who we really are. Yet so many of us continue to be pulled, distracted and confused because our attention re remains on this world. Why is withdrawing our attention so difficult? Why does it elude so many of us, even when we try to meditate? The answer is simple. The mind of a human being loves pleasure, loves pleasant things, and loves to write and go in the direction where it can seek pleasure. When the mind tries to go within, when our attention tries to go within, we see nothing but darkness. We run out. And there is all the pleasure. The same pleasure can become pain also, which is very often does. But at least we are seeking where we see something. Inside we don't. But with proper guided meditation, you will find more pleasure inside 
then you will find outside automatically your mind will go in. But for the time that is not happening, the mind will have a tendency to go out. It's always been seeking pleasures outside. The mind has a habit of looking for pleasures. Secondly, it has a habit of seeking new pleasure. If one pleasure you get tired of, you want to find something else. That's the nature of the mind. Therefore, it wanders around all over outside. But once the inside experience becomes good, with proper guided meditation, you just told me you had a good time inside for a few brief moments. One day it will become so pleasant that the mind will not run outside to seek pleasure. It will always run inside to seek pleasure and then the withdrawal of attention will become very easy. Why do we have to meditate on the form of the master when God is within us in the form of the self? Shouldn't we start right out by seeing God as everything and love all? Surely God is in all of us. And, but nobody has seen God, unfortunately. When you want to make a picture of God, that's seeing the mind, not God. Mind is not God. Mind is a servant. Mind has been given to us to serve us. We start treating our servant as God. What the biggest, biggest folly we can make? We start thinking that the mind's picture, mind's thoughts are God, making the biggest blunder of life. Mind is an obstruction right now to our own going within our own self. And how can we make mind and its thoughts and its pictures as God? That's not God. Of course, nobody has seen God and nobody has seen the self. We are only seeing pictures projected by the mind. If you want to see God, surely you see God inside where you know who you are first of all. When you will have seen yourself, you will have seen God. I promise you that. If you have seen your true self, you have seen the expanded self, that is God. That is the creator of everything. You are a part of that, have always been a part of that, never separated from it. It's the illusion of separation that you have to overcome. So you want to really see God? Sure, you should see God by knowing yourself. Don't see pictures outside and imagination outside and say it's God, which is most of us are making a big mistake, thinking that mind is God. Mind is not God. Mind is a machine. Mind just works for that. And we just make pictures with the mind. We say, no, no, I am speaking to God. I am seeing God. You are just talking to your mind. You are talking to the very thing that is leading you to distraction. You are talking to the very little machine given to you at power to think. And you begin to... Uh, Regard the thinking machine as God, and whatever it thinks becomes God. No. When you will go beyond the mind, you will see God. Till you can go there and see the God, where do you see God? At least when we say that meet a perfect living master, perfect living master is seeing God at the time when you see him. He is not seeing God some other time. When you are talking to a perfect living master, at that very moment he is actually seeing God. That's the best way I can see. God in one, God is in everybody and everything, but you don't see it because the consciousness is not God consciousness. But when you meet a person with that consciousness, you are seeing a person in whom God is apparent to that person and visible. There is no better way to see God than to see one who has realized God and is sitting in front of us. That is why we say perfect living master is one who is seeing God at the time when he is talking to us. And he is with the same single awareness of God when he is talking to us as a human being. That's the best way we can see. That is why we recommend that if you want to see God at the earliest stages of your meditation, where you haven't reached anywhere near discovering who you are or discovering who God is, then the best alternative is to think of that, think of that person who has seen God, is with God at all times. So that's why. We recommend a contemplation of the face of a master. That is why we recommend initiation and following a perfect living master. That is the closest you can get in this life, in this physical world, to seeing God or being with God. If one is inside, then will one be unaware of the outside? Absolutely. We want to go inside and we can't be inside so long as we are of, of the outside. This system of consciousness 
and the series of ways devolving of consciousness through dreamlike states from one level to another has been designed to create reality for us, not illusion for us. We are not seeing a movie. We are seeing how the process of suggestion, power, power of the mind's projection can create reality for us. This whole creation is based upon the concept that we have to create reality. At one time, there is only one reality. At this time, the outside is our only reality. When you go inside and also aware of the outside reality, you are not really gone inside. You are still in the twilight zone of fantasy and imagination. When you really go inside, the outside will disappear and be like a dream. When you wake up in the morning from a dream, you don't stay in the dream and stay uh, up in the wakeful state. The dream has ended. It was the dream. It was not real. This is real. When you go to a dream, that is real. And this is not real. We don't, we've forgotten about it. So that is why when you have a real visit inside, this will become, you'll be unaware of this. It will disappear. When you come back, that will disappear. And that will look like a dream. People have such wonderful experiences in meditation. And they've seen things which are far more real than this. And they know it when they're seeing it. This is reality. I have been here so long. This was my real home. And now then you come back, what a lucid dream I had. What a wonderful dream. Because this has become reality for us. And that cannot live like reality at that time. It takes the shape of a memory of something beautiful, wonderful, more real, yet not very distinguishable from a dream. So at one time we have only one reality. Except when we reach the top, we discover all realities were created out of the power of illusion. And the power of illusion created all. Then you can stay in all the different levels. At the same time, knowing all are reality and all are unreal at the same time. But that state is only achieved when you go to totality of consciousness. Not earlier. Before that, there is only one reality at one time. Yes, surely, when you are inside, you become unaware of the outside. I always thought that our senses serve as the gateway to our inner self and can provide the first glimpse to awareness. Obvious, obviously, based on your experience, I am wrong and the tangible world we see with our senses is separated from the real. Could you speak on that? The sensory system is one. It is not two. That you have one system here in the physical world, you have another system inside. It's the same system. It's the system we call the astral self, we call the sensory body. The sensory body is not a body. It's a combination of sense perceptions that make that body. The power to see, the power to hear, the power to touch, taste and smell. These sensory experiences are built into the system that we call the astral body. It's not a separate body or something. It's our own senses which we are using now. Those senses when purified by not being mixed up with material things, not being mixed up in the material body, becomes the astral body. Therefore, they are not separate senses outside and separate senses inside. They are the same senses. The same senses which can operate very efficiently without the physical body are now operating through the cover of the physical body and with reduced efficiency in every level. We can't see very well with these eyes because we are seeing with the astral eyes through physical apparatus. The physical eyes are not seen by themselves. If you are unconscious, the physical eyes are open, they don't see anything. When we are conscious, it's the consciousness that's making physical eyes see through the astral eyes inside. That you will discover when you withdraw your attention and make this body not part of the system of perceptions. The same perceptions are really using this body to become self-perceptions here. They are not two separate things. That is why don't think that there is a separate way of looking outside, separate way of looking inside. Use the same power of seeing, same power of hearing. Right now in the physical body you are using it outside. When you withdraw attention with the same power you see inside. And the same power is functioning even at this time. You did an experience just now in meditation. Where I said, see your master, see your beloved inside, which I saw that. Same power of seeing, but not these eyes. These eyes were closed. You close these eyes, 
Yet in your imagination you could see the imaginary eyes that saw were the same power of seeing but not different power of seeing. The eyes were different because those eyes of imagination and these are eyes of the physical body. But the power that sees is the same in both cases. So uh, it is not that uh, I am saying that you can't use the sense perception to go in. I am only saying instead of looking out with the same power of seeing, look inside. It's not different. Can you explain what certain colors and numbers mean in the astral plane and in our lives? The numbers are a conceptual way of creating and observing creation. When we say number two, we mean double. If you multiply by two, you are doubling anything. It does not apply to any particular table or something. It applies if I say that uh, your body has become double, it's been multiplied by two. Two is the power of doubling an experience. So when you have this number, the, all the numbers that we are using, and many which have not been used, are all expressive of a function in crea creating the blocks of experience that we are seeing outside and inside. So the numbers are actually uh, powers of creating certain dimensions of experience in space and time. These numbers originate from the causal plane and they become more applicable, practical in the astral plane and they become completely a matter of calculation in the physical plane. In the causal plane, these numbers are living entities. They are living entities with souls. Like we have a soul here. A number is a living entity. Two can speak to three, which we can't do over here at all. They're just numbers. The numbers become entities as building blocks of all experiences at the causal plane. Similarly, shapes, geometrical shapes. What's a triangle? What's a rectangle? What's a circle? These are only used geometrical figures here. But when you go inside, you find that these very figures have been used to create the whole structure of all experience. And when you go to causal plane, they are entities in which you can have, because you don't have physical entities there, you entities in conceptual terms. These are parts of the conceptual entities in which we live as souls. And therefore, when we go to the causal plane, you will see the reality of these. Since these are coming from there as building blocks of all experience, they have an influence here too. Whatever we are seeing here is also built up of colors and numbers and, and shapes. Everything is being built up with these concepts. The concepts start in the causal plane, they become ideas of application in the astral plane, they become solid material experiences in the physical plane. But they are the same concepts. They are the same operating through these covers upon ourselves. These covers are not separate, being separate different worlds. These covers are about the same reality. Our soul is the reality that provides life and consciousness. When it's covered by the mind, it splits that reality, it expands that reality into time and space. Time begins to flow and space is expanded. When it comes into the astral plane, it splits that perception into different types of perceptions. Seeing becomes separate from hearing, touching becomes separate. When it comes to the physical world and its last physical body, the same power through the same filters comes and operates here with the shapes and forms which make up this experience of the physical world. It's a beautiful way to create. It's the best way to create. It's been used as the most optimal way to create. That's why I say, go within, see from that side. We are seeing from, from the side of create, created form. Look at from the creation's point of view. And you will see how these are functioning at different levels, performing their functions and creating the experiences we are having right up to the physical plane. They're not separate. So therefore, they all have a significance even in our life over here. Before the physical initiation, can those souls be seen attending the master's satsang on an inner plane? There is no physical initiation. 
initiation is always inside. Physi initiation does not mean a perfect living master telling us how to meditate. All the masters tell us. You can even read in books. Initiation does not mean that how we can close our eyes and perform certain kinds of rituals about meditation. Anybody can tell that. Initiation is entirely a different thing. Initiation is a perfect living master in full consciousness of the entire secret of reality and secret of the creator, in full consciousness says to us, I accept you as a friend of mine, let's go back home together. That's initiation. Initiation is acceptance by a perfect living master that now I take you, we'll travel back home together. It is not based on our karma. It's not based whether we're good or bad. It's not based upon a judgment. It's not based upon any teaching. It's not based upon any of these things. It's based upon whether when we came into this creation as individuated souls, whether we had a desire just to be here temporarily and go back home and made an arrangement for it. The arrangement itself brings a perfect living master into our life. We made it ourselves that if we get fed up of this new creation, new experiences, and want to become seekers and go back home, such an experience should take place that a person projected by our own mind should come and be called perfect living master and he should initiate and that's the way process back we arranged ourselves before the world was created. And now therefore the perfect living masters who come as human beings in our lives, they come with the mandate at this time, these souls who had asked for this promise are ready. He searches as a human being, he meets the other human beings in whom those souls are now vested and he says time to go home, yes it's time, it's ready. Initiation, we are going back home. That's initiation. Initiation is a perfect living master taking full responsibility to take you back home without judgment, without conditions. If he says, oh, you follow this diet, if he says you do meditation regularly, if you say struggle hard for this, he is not doing, saying that to your soul, he is saying that to your mind. Because the mind says we can get nothing without our own struggle. Mind says, unless we act, we are not going to be spoon fed by anybody. The master has come to spoon feed us, but we don't accept it. We say, no, we have to struggle, we have to deserve it first. We have to be good to be deserving, we have to do this, we pass judgment upon ourselves all the time, while the master is holding his hand and saying, no, time to go home, no judgment. He's not come to see how we are trapped in this physical world with our own karma. He knows karma is not on the soul at all. Karma is carried by the mind. He's struggle with people, struggle with sickness and health, struggle with all this is on the mind and the body. Nothing to do with the soul. He's come for the soul to go back home and realize this. And when he says, I initiate you, he takes you back home, guaranteed. That's for initiation. So initiation, there's no physical initiation. Physical method is just to appease the mind, keep it busy, keep it away almost from the soul going back home to almost uh, feed it some, something. Okay, do meditation, do this, see these things. Well, Make it interested in that pathway within. And not that, the, uh, that meditation has never taken anybody home. People are meditating all their lives. It's the initiation by a perfect living master and the love and devotion that he makes us feel for him that takes us back home. So that's why there was a man, a very poor man in India, and he was living in a village, had no money at all, living, just surviving a few belongings and few things he grew in a little piece of borrowed land and he had a very strong feeling that there is a master pulling him and he had a dream in which he saw a man with a white beard saying, come on, you are ready. He said, what is this call? He checked up and they said, there is a master living at that distance on a bank of a river. He said, I am going to go there. He had no money to buy a bus ticket. He took up a few of his belongings, put them in a bag, put it on his shoulder, started walking. He walked for almost a month, every day saying, you called me, I'm coming, you called me, I'm coming. And he, I was present with great master, 
He was just coming out of the door of his house. We were both standing outside. This rugged man, full of all the dust of his travel, carrying a little bag, came from a distance, threw the bag there, ran, fell at the feet of the great master, said, Master, I have come, initiate me. The master's words were, what once again? He had never seen him physically. And master suddenly realized that what he had said, he said, oh, I mean, you initiated the day you left your village. You mean to teach you how to meditate? We'll do it tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So, do not think that initiation by a perfect living master consists of anything more than accepting you as a friend who will go back home with him. So that's what is initiation. The rest is all for appeasing our mind, to make it work the way it likes to work, and then go back. There are so many things that happen in initiation which we can't see outside because we are living in a totally different kind of material, illusory world that has got so much limitation on it, on what we can see here. But when you go within and see how your destiny was created, how are you poor or rich, how are you born here or there, how did this happen? How come somebody is born in a very poor country, lives such a hard life, somebody is born in a rich country, in a rich place and is having luxuries of his life? How can there be so much discrimination? Religions tell us that we are all children of God. What kind of God would be who would make so much discrimination amongst his own children and put so much and so many of them into great suffering for no reason and put so many to have joys of life for no reason? How do you justify this discrimination? Well, the Eastern law of karma is a good explanation. Whether it's a good reality or not doesn't matter, it's a good explanation. That it is our own karma, that means our own actions that made us rich or poor, our own actions make us sick or healthy, our own actions are creating the problems of life. If you believe in the law of karma, that explains a lot. It's a law, they say, you follow the law because the law cannot be broken by anybody. They say in the Bible, I read the, when the blind, when a father brought his born blind son to the master, and he said, Master, this son of mine is born blind. Was he born blind because of his actions or the actions of his father? If he had no time to have any action, he just born. Father, why should the father be responsible for a child's blindness? Jesus answers, it is neither the sins of this child nor the sins of the father. It is that the law may prevail. He says that clearly in the Bible. Which law? Which law explains that? Except the law of karma, except the law of reincarnation, except the law that says whatever you do, there is a reward and punishment set up for you. And this law creates the real prison house in which we are trapped here. Because we can't help but either do good or bad or different things. Every time we do good, we are entitled to, be, uh, to a reward. Every time we do bad, we have to be punished. Where? Over here. We can't get out of it. If there was one real stranglehold created for souls, this was it. The law of karma, the law of reincarnation and being stuck with the law of punishment and reward. So that's why the people who are trapped here, perfect living master, don't come to judge. The judgment is going on already in our own minds. The judgment, the negative power itself provides enough judgment on us. There was a uh, man, uh, he came one day to the perfect living master. And he said, Master, forgive me. I sent, almost uh, might be, he was thinking of his own confessional or something, that he talked like that to Master. He was, I was there when this happened. The man fell at his feet, at the great Master's feet, and he said, Master, forgive me. You told me I should not drink alcohol. I drank with a group of people last night. I was drunk. You told me not to eat meat and I ate all kinds of steaks that they served. You told me, don't open eyes, don't do this. I had all kinds of luxuries with women who were present in the party. Please forgive me. Great Master says, all right, you are forgiven. Don't do it again. Man said, thank you, thank you, and ran away. Everybody sitting around the Master, particularly the secretaries to the Master. He said, Master, what kind of thing was that? The man defied all your orders. He made all the big mistakes and then you just say forgive. 
Supposing he does the same thing again and comes to you and says, forgive me, will you again forgive him? Master, I think I'll again forgive him. Master, when will you punish him? He says, don't you see his mind is punishing him already? Don't you see he's already being punished within himself? Don't put me into punishers. Let me remain in the, in the group of forgivers, the great master said. These perfect living masters who come here, they are forgivers. They don't come to punish, they come to forgive. They realize in what traps we are, what temptations are we are facing, the distractions we are facing. They know it. They know we are in a trap. They have compassion because of our condition, not judgment. <coughs> Therefore, with their love and compassion, they forgive and they want to take us back home out of this mess. They want to take us out of the law of karma. And as soon as you step out of the law of your mind, you'll be out of the law of karma. Karma is only in the mind. It is not on the soul ever. So that's why masters don't initiate you for nothing. What about this law of karma itself? The karma is of three kinds. One, you're born with, with previous actions of past lives. You can be blind, you can be rich, you can be poor. You have no control over yourself. You never did anything in this particular birth. It's all from somewhere else that came up from your own, because you are suffering. You did it. You did something. You are rewarded. You did something to gain the, the, gain the reward. Then you're doing the same things all over again in this life, and many rewards and punishments come right now in the same life. Some are carried on for the next life. We are so capable of taking decisions, good and bad. We take it all the time. It's not necessary to uh, spell out in an action. A decision taken in our mind which is good is good karma. A decision taken in our mind which is evil and bad is evil karma. Even if there's no action following it, it's still being recorded and it's all collecting. We are capable of collecting so much of this karma that there is no way to put it all in the next life. What happens to most of it goes into another area called reserve. And the reserve is all held in the causal plane on the mind of the person. The same mind comes again and again different bodies. That mind carries that baggage <coughs> and that load on itself. And that whole cumulative effect of all the karma creates our attitudes and not events. Events are created by actual events that happen. But the attitude is created by a cumulative effect of all the karma and that whole karma is then held in reserve. Then we create more karma now and these three types of karma, the one we come with is destiny or we call pradab in Hindi, Indian language. We call kariman or the new action we are creating in our mind or outside. And then there is a third one, the reserve, which we call sinchir. These three karmas are holding us here forever. Biggest trap of our own making through by thinking we are the mind and we are trapped in it. But when you are initiated by a perfect living master, the first thing he does at the very moment of initiation is he destroys all that sinchit karma completely. So that there is no way anything from your past lives can be taken up to make a new life for you. The only area from where another life can be made is from what you do now in one life. So this life will be always better if you are a seeker and you are working on seeking yourself here. And if, if necessary to come in the next life, then this will help you because there is a very small group of actions for which the next life can be made. That's a big advantage of initiation. Secondly, if you meditate properly or follow the instructions of the perfect living master who initiates you and you say, I am the disciple of that particular master. And what he says, you do that, you don't have to come here again, ever. This is your last life. If you cannot follow the instructions, you fall a prey to your mind's temptations, your, your mind's distractions, you may have to come once more. Only when you become totally escaping from this path, saying this is all hoax, there's nothing real, that you may have to come third time. If you become critical, and attack the master, kill him, you may have to come fourth time, but the master will still take you if he has initiated you. This is a very different kind of uh, thing than any teaching of any kind. It's not a teaching. Initiation nothing to do with teaching. Teachings can be done by any number of teachers. The books full of teachings, same teachings. 
It is the relationship that a soul has with another soul who is aware, in his awareness of totality of the soul, meeting another soul and saying, time to go home, you asked for it, let's go, that's the initiation. So the truth is there is no physical uh, initiation and the souls who can see with their own eyes in their physical body, the physical body of a perfect living master, when they see, they are marked. That means at some point they will go back home. That means it's a reminder to those souls that yes, you didn't make a promise, you forgot, you were too involved here with this experience. Yes, you are marked. If the master happens to see, then with the next few lives you will be initiated, if not in the same life. So that's why these are great experiences to be in the presence of a person who is not capable of going to higher levels but is at all higher level at all times while sitting with us. That's the kind of person we want. That's the kind of person who will find us when we are ready. How are we ready? We are seeking. is so strong. Our love for the truth is so strong. We want to go back home so desperately. We say we have had about this. We had enough. If somebody says I had enough, then that's a sign for being ready. If you feel no, it's not, a, it's not a bad place to be in. I'm having a good time here and let me live out my life well. I will be granted this nice life. Go ahead and live it well. When I was in Boston, a man came to me, a friend of mine. He said, you know, you keep on telling people that this is not real. You go there and this is a, just a created, projected world and the real world is inside. I have a very nice home. I have a beautiful wife. I have beautiful children. And I have all the money in the world that I can buy anything. I have all the goodies of the world. I enjoy myself. Why should I follow you? I say, you don't have to follow me at all. Go and have a good time. Your destiny says, have a good time with what God has given you. You're a lucky person. Enjoy this experience. After one week, he came back again to me crying. He said, my life is in ruins. The woman I love left me, ditched me. That happened with me. He had never thought of the emotional side of life when he talked to me first. By looking at the riches and looking at the people around him and the home and his house and the cars and so on, they don't make you happy. The emotional side was so bad. He said, please forgive me for saying I am happy here. I am not happy here at all. None of these things takes away my pain. I said, you know, so many people who want to look like they are happy, they want to keep up with the Joneses, keep up with their neighbors. No, no, we are very happy. And when they are alone, they are so unhappy. When they think of their own emotional state, they are so unhappy. The biggest source of unhappiness is lying inside us also, and that's the source of our seeking also. And that is loneliness. We feel lonely. Even in a crowd, even in a company, like there is nobody really understanding us. Nobody, all our relationships are skin deep. Nobody can see through our body and through our skin what's happening inside. When a master comes into our life, first time we begin to feel, I think he can see more than, than others can see. I think he can see more than I can see. As the relationship develops, Ultimately say, he knows everything more about me than I know and he's the best guide for me. It automatically happens like that. That's a big distinction between other relationships we have and relationship with the master. I sometimes say there is nothing greater in this world, the physical world, than a good friend. A friend who never leaves you. A friend who loves you unconditionally. A friend who doesn't judge you. If you want to find a friend who doesn't judge you, loves you unconditionally, never leaves you, loves you all the time, I would call him perfect living master. Because I've seen these qualities in a perfect living master and nowhere else. All of us are guided by their minds and get angry and get upset and run away. But not a perfect living master. Never runs away. Never judges us. That is a true friend forever. When he shakes the hand of friendship which we call initiation, he says, I'll be a friend forever, not in this world, not in this life, forever, till we reach home, which is permanent. 
which is never destroyed. So that's a permanent friendship. And a friendship that takes away the loneliness right from here and never returns even when we go back home. So that's an amazing friendship. So don't regard the initiation as something less than this grand adventure, the biggest possible thing that can ever happen to us when we are in physical bodies. Last question. Okay, I'll finish the last question then. <clears throat> Dear Dr. Ishwar Puri Ji, on the path of Sant Mat, we are taught that you need a living master. I know you are initiated by Hazur Baba Sawan Singh, but after his passing, did you follow his successors? If not, can you tell why? Thank you. If I found a perfect living master, and he was perfect, then he must be with me even now. He must be alive for me now. He must be constantly my friend and talking to me now. We must be traveling, have a good time here and there now. If I am having that experience, why would I look for somebody else? When you find a perfect living master and manifest his radiant form and meditation inside, you never need anybody else. Therefore, it's not a path where you say, that man died, this man has succeeded, therefore we follow that man. It's not a physical thing. It's a personal friendship with a master who finds you. You don't find because you can't recognize a master. He finds you, shows himself in different ways through private small, small miracles, shows you his identity, and that remains your perfect friend forever. Why well, look for somebody else? So that's the reason. I didn't have to look for anybody else. I heard there are many masters. I have met many masters. I have met masters when they were babies. I have met masters who were grown up. I have met masters who were in different countries, speaking different languages. I have met so many, I respect all of them. I love them because they are telling people to do what my master told me. But I don't have to change master just because somebody else has come up also. And my master was not master because he was a physical being. He showed to me while he was alive that the real master is in sight. The physical being is an external form of the real master. And when he showed me a real form, you don't have to worry about anything else at all. You found the real master, he'll be with you at all times. Thank you very much for coming today. And I uh, enjoyed uh, uh, meeting some of you personally. And when we have more time, we can have longer interviews also for those who would like to meet one-on-one. -on -one. And this was uh, a pleasant time for me. Nice weather, good time. I'm very happy to see all of you friends. Thank you. God bless you.